I'm uh, Coach Edwards, uh, sixth grade, and uh, I'm going to be reading The Friday Everything Changed by Ann Hart. Tradition. In Miss Ralston's class, the boys have always carried the water bucket until one day the girls decide it's time to challenge the rule. The last hour of school on Friday afternoons was for Junior Red Cross. The little kids would get out their Junior Red Cross pins and put them on and us big kids would start elbowing down the aisles to the book cupboard at the back to see who would get the interesting magazines. There was a big pile of them and they were of two kinds, the National Geographic and the Junior Red Cross News. Because the boys were stronger and sat near the back, they usually got the National Geographic first, which meant they could spend the rest of Red Cross looking at the ladies, while us girls had to be satisfied with the Junior Red Cross News, which showed little kids wearing lots of clothes and learning how to read. Apart from the magazines for the big kids, and maybe the teacher reading a story to the little kids about the only other thing that happened regularly during Red Cross was picking the two boys who would carry water the next week. In our school, the water bucket always stood on a shelf at the front of the room just behind the teacher's desk. First, you'd make a paper cut out of a piece of scribble paper. Then you'd grab the teacher's attention from whatever it happened to be, and then up you'd go to the front of the room for a drink from the water bucket. It was kind of interesting to stand at the front of the room behind the teacher's desk and drink water. The school looked different from up there, and sometimes you could get just a glimpse of an idea of what the teacher thought she was all about. I mean, from the front, looking down on those rows of kids with their heads bent over their desk, and the sun coming in the windows, and the blackboards and all that stuff on the walls, you might almost think, at first glance, that you were looking at one of those real city schools, like in the health books, where the kids were all so neat and all the same size, but after the first strange moment, it just became our school again because you had to start adding in things like coal stove and a scared old double desk and the kids themselves. I mean, we just didn't look like the kids in those pictures. Maybe it was because we were so many different sizes from the kids, <clears throat> from the kids snuffling in the front rows over their man and dan readers to the big boys hunched over their desk at the back, maybe it was because we wore so many heavy clothes all the time, or maybe it was because of something that wasn't even there at all, but seemed to be on the faces of the kids in those city pictures. They look as if they liked being where they were. But all of that's a long way from the Junior Red, Cro Red Cross, and who would carry the water? The water for our school came from a pump at the railway station which was about a quarter of a mile away. One day, long ago, a health inspector had come around and had announced that water must be made available to the school. For a while, there had been some talk of digging a well, but in the end, we got a big, shiny, galvanized water bucket and permission to use the railway pump station. And from that day on, for all the boys, the most important thing that happened at school, even more important than softball, was who would get to carry the water. If you were a boy, it was something you started dreaming, dreaming about in grade one. Even though there was not the remotest chance it could ever happen to you before at least grade five, and only then if the teacher thought you were big and strong enough, you dreamed about it partly because carrying the water meant you were one of the big guys. And carrying the water meant you could get away from school for maybe half an hour at a time. But mostly you dreamed about it because carrying the water was something real and had absolutely nothing whatever to do with man and Dan and all that stuff. So every Friday afternoon toward the end of Red Cross when it got to be time for the teacher to pick the two boys who would go for the water the next week, all the National Geographics came to rest like huge butterflies folding up their yellow wings and a big hush fell all over the back rows. And that's the way it had always been until one extraordinary afternoon 
when right out of the blue, just after the teacher had picked Ernie Chapman and Garrett Dixon to carry the water, my seatmate, Alma Niles, put her hand up and said, why can't the girls go for the water too? If one of those German planes, like in the war movies, had suddenly appeared on the school and dropped a bomb, we all couldn't have been more surprised. A silence fell over the moon, and in that silence, everyone looked at the teacher. Now, our teacher that year was named Miss Ralston, and even though she came from River Herbert, we all liked her quite a lot. She was strict, but she was never really mean, like some of the teachers would have, because she was young, she just finished grade 11 the year before herself. She's had quite a rough time the first week of school with the bigger boys, but she was pretty big herself. And after she had strapped most of them up in the front of the room before our very eyes, things had settled down. The boys kind of admired Miss Ralston for strapping so hard, and us girls admired her because she was so pretty and wore nylon stockings and loafers all the time. But the really unusual thing about her was the way she sometimes stopped in the middle of a lesson and looked at us if, as if we were real people. Instead of just a lot of kids, we had to be pushed through the next grade. And that was why, on that Friday afternoon, when Alma Niles put her hand up and said, why can't girls go for water too? We all turned and looked at Miss Ralston First, instead of just bursting out laughing at Alma right away, Miss Ralston, instead of saying, whoever heard of girls going for water, or are you trying to be saucy, Alma, like any other teacher would, <coughs> or in y'all's terms, salty, right? But like any other teacher would, said nothing at all for a moment, but just looked very hard at Alma who had gone quite white with the shock of dropping such a bombshell. After a long moment when she finally spoke, Miss Ross, instead of saying, Wow, that's out of the question, Alma, threw a bombshell of her own. I'll think about that, she said, as if you know she would, and I'll let you know next Friday. The trouble started right away as soon as we got into the schoolyard because all the boys knew from the moment Miss Ralston had spoken that something of theirs was being threatened and that as long as there was the remotest chance that the girl might get to carry the water, they had to do everything in their power to stop it. Like driving a tractor or playing hockey for the Toronto Medical Leafs, carrying water was real and because it was real it belonged to them. So they went right for Alma as soon as she came out of school, and that was when another funny thing happened. Instead of just standing back and watching, Alma got beaten up, as we usually did when the boys were after someone. The girls rushed right in to try to help her. In the first place, we all liked Alma. In the second place, we all had seen, as clearly as the boys, what our carrying the water might mean that incredibly we too might get to skip school for half an hour at a time, that we too might get to sneak into Roswell's store on the way back, and most dizzying thought of all, that we too might be, get to do something real. And because we're so intoxicated by the whole idea, and took to the boys so much by surprise by standing up to them, we somehow managed to get Alma and ourselves out of the schoolyard with only a few bruises and torn stockings, leaving the boys in possession of the schoolyard, where as we could have glimpsed over our shoulders as we ran down the hill, they had begun to gather together in a single ominous night. <clears throat> and for the rest of that weekend, though of course we never talked about it in front of our parents, all we could think of, both boys and girls, was what was going to happen at school that coming week. The way we played, for example, every single boy had to get out before the other team could come in. And any boy hitting a home run not only had the right to bat straight away again, but also has to bring back into game any boy who had gotten out which led to kids who couldn't remember their six times tables properly being able to announce, say, by noon on Thursday. The score is now 46 to 39 because the last inning starting Tuesday lunchtime 
junior team was all out except for Irving Snell, who hit three homers in a row off Lauren Ripley and brought in Ira and Jim and Elton, who brought in the rest except for Austin, who got out for the second time on Wednesday with a foul ball one of the girls caught behind third base. Some days it got so exciting that at noon we couldn't wait to eat our lunches, but would rush straight into the schoolyard, gobbling our sandwiches as we ran toward that aching moment when the ball, snacking across the yellow grass and arching toward us from the marsh sky, might meet our open, eager hands. So it was hard. It was a hard blow Monday morning recess when Ernie Chapman whirled the bat around his head, slammed it down as hard as he could on home base, and announced, "The first girl that goes out to the field, we break." We clustered formally from the girls' entry door, knowing there was nothing we could really do. Oh, Alma, mourn many holiday biting the ends of her long brown hair. Why couldn't you just have kept your mouth shut? It was a bad moment if we'd tried to go out to the field. They'd have picked us off one by one. We couldn't even play softball on our own. None of us owned a bat and a ball. If it hadn't been for Doris, we might have broken right rank right there and then. Doris, who was in ninth grade, had a home permanent and sometimes wore nail polish and had even, it was rumored, gone swimming in the quarry all alone, flicked a rock against the schoolhouse wall in the silence following Minnie's remark and steadied us all by saying, don't be foolish, Minnie, all we have to do is wait. They knit us the field and besides, they kind of like to have us out there looking at them when they get up to bat. But, it was long, hard week. Besides not letting us fail, the boys picked on us whenever they got the chance. I guess they figured that if they made things bad enough for us, sooner or later we'd go to Miss Rawson and ask her to forget the whole thing. But all their picking on and bullying did was to keep us together. Whenever one of us tripped going down the aisle or got an ink ball in our hair or got trapped in the outhouse by a bunch of boys, it was as if it was happening to all of us, and looking back on that week when there were so many bad feelings and so many new feelings in the, in the air, it was kind of nice too because the first time us girls found ourselves telling each other our troubles and even our thoughts without worrying about being laughed at, and that was something new at our school. Don't care who carries the water as long as it gets carried. Alma said, Arnold, earnestly, the other guys would kill me if they ever found out I told you, but sometimes carrying the water isn't that much fun. On cold days, it's real hard work. You're better off in a warm school. Alma knew what it cost Arnold to tell her this, but he stood firm. I'm sorry, Arnold, she said, but I'm used to cold weather. In winter, I walk to school the same as you. So Arnold went away. If Miss Rawson, as the week wore on, noticed anything unusual going on in her school, she gave little signs of it. She passed out the usual punishments for ink balls and intercepted threatening notes and tore them up unread. She looked at Alma's white face and all she asked about were the principal rivers of Europe. Nor were we surprised nothing in our experience had led us to believe the grown-ups had the slightest inkling or interest in what really went on with the kids. Only Doris thought differently. Miss Ralston looked real mad, said Doris, as we trailed in thankfully from Friday morning recess. Mad? A couple of us asked. Yes. Like, when she comes out to ring the bell and we're hanging around the entry door like a lot of scared chickens, she rings the old handbell as if she wished all those yelling boys' heads were under it. Of course, they do things differently in Hybert. I know for a fact that girls there get to play on softball teams just like the boys. On teams just like the boys. But it was all too much for us to take in at the moment, so preoccupied were we with the afternoon's decision on the water. All that long, hard week, it was as if Friday afternoon the Junior Red Cross could never come again. 
now that it was almost upon us, most of us forgot in our excitement, at least for the time being, Doris had a remark about softball. So at lunchtime, just as the boys were winding up their week's game, <clears throat> so at lunchtime, just as the boys were winding up their week's game in real great, without the girls, Ernie Chatwin was gloating loudly from the pitcher's mound when Miss Ralston, without her bail, leaped through our clustered huddles at the entry door and headed straight toward the softball field. She took us all completely by surprise. Crunch, crunch, crunch went Miss Ralston, bright red loafers against the cinders and the next thing we knew she's grabbed the bat from Irving Snell and squinting against the sun was twirling and lining it up before an astonished eyes. Come on, come on, cried Miss Ralston impatiently to Ernie who stood transfixed before the pitcher's mound. Come on, come on, she cried again and she banged the bat against the ground. Come on, cried Doris and we rushed after her across the cinders. The first ball Ernie threw was pretty wobbly and Miss Rawson hit it at an angle so that it fell sideways. A foul ball. George Fowler's outstretched hand. Oh, we moaned from the sidelines and some of us closed our eyes so we wouldn't have to look, but George jumped too eagerly for such an easy ball and it fell right through his fingers and rolled harmlessly along the ground. Army. Ernie took a lot more time over his second pitch. He was getting over the first shock of finding Miss Ralston opposite him. At bat, by this time, he was receiving shouts of encouragement from all over the field. Get her, get her, the boys yelled recklessly. And Ernie, and they all fanned out behind the bases. Ernie took aim slowly. None of us had ever seen the pirouettes of professional pitchers, but there was a certain awesome ceremony nonetheless. As Ernie spat savagely on the ball, glared hard at Miss Ralston, slowly swung the bat, his big right arm, and poised for one long moment, his whole body outstretched through the ball as hard as he could toward home base, where Miss Ralston waited, her body rocking with the bat. For a fleeting moment, we had a glimpse of what life might be like in River Herbert, and then Miss Rawson hit the ball. Oh, we cried as it rose high in the air, borne by the marsh wind and flew like a bird against the sun, across the road and out of sight into the ox pasture on the other side. Oh, we all stared at Miss Rawson. School's in, she announced over her shoulder, walking away, hitting the ball into the ox pasture happened maybe once a year. That afternoon, toward the end of Red Cross, there was a big hush all over the room. Next week, Miss Ralston, closing the school register, tidying her books. Next week, Alma Niles and Joyce Shipley will go for the water. She swept her hand over the top of her desk and tiny dust motes danced in the slanting sun. So, after hearing this story, um, like for you to write a summary and discuss the summary of this story with your parents.